Regular meeting number 20 will now come to order. Now we please stand for the playing of the uh, national anthem. Member Page, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This evening, we are uh, honored to have Bishop Donald J. Washington of uh, Mount Hermon Missionary Baptist Church here to lead us in prayer. Bishop, welcome back to Council and thank you. Shall we pray? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We are to call thy nearness as we begin these deliberations tonight. We ask your blessings upon our president of the council and the members. Pray that they do their work well. We ask you because you have put your spirit in them have given gifts to them, and we pray, God, that you would ultimately do works through them on behalf of the constituency of Columbus, Ohio. Now, Lord, we thank you for our being here today. Make sure that all that we do would be done in thy name. We give you honor and praise in him who is able to keep us from falling and present us faultless, even Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. You. Thank you, Bishop. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Harden. Any person who takes any actions to obstruct or interfere with the conduct of tonight's meeting may be charged with disturbing a lawful meeting pursuant to Columbus City Code 2317.12. Any person who enters those areas of city council chambers reserved for city officials or invited guests may be charged with criminal trespass pursuant to Columbus City Code 2311.21. Can I get a motion to dispense with the reading of the journal? Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Harden. This week's communications received by the city clerk's office are listed on the agenda and will be published in the city bulletin. Are there any other communications to be read into the record? Not at this time. Seeing none, are there any resolutions by members of council? Council member Elizabeth Brown? Council member Mitchell Brown? None this evening, sir. Thank you. Council member Emmanuel Remy. Yes, sir. Thank you, Council President Hardin. I would like to invite Buzz Thomas, Buffy Patterson, Michael Jones, and all the realtors that I see in attendance here tonight to the podium as I introduce Resolution 0106X 2018 to honor, recognize, and celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act of 1968. Whereas April 11, 2018 is the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act of 1968. It's also known as the Fair Housing Act. The Fair Housing Act protects people from discrimination when they are renting, buying, or securing financing for any housing. The prohibition specifically covered discrimination because of race, color, national origin, religion, sex, disability, and presence of children. And the city of Columbus is committed to the mission and intent of Congress to provide fair and equal housing opportunities for all. Columbus City Council believes that access to fair housing laws have made our community stronger and more vibrant. 
and we are committed to programs that will help educate the public about the right to equal housing in the city of Columbus and promote housing choices that foster inclusiveness that is free from housing discri discrimination. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Council of the City of Columbus that this council does hereby recognize April 11, 2018 as the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act of 1968 and thank the many people and organizations in our community who have opened in the doors of housing opportunity to all citizens. I want to further um, acknowledge the folks that are up here this evening. Um, the National Association of Realtors played a pivotal role in the passage of the Fair Hous Housing Act of 1968, as well as the amendment in 1988, and continue to honor and support this legis legislation by incorporating key components of this act in their code of e ethics. The Columbus Realtors are no exception in our local community. We are very committed to, as an industry, to making sure that fair housing is incorporated across all of our business practices. Buzz, I'd like to have you at the podium and, and say a few words. My name is Buzz Thomas. I'm a realtor and my good friend Emmanuel Remy, Councilman Remy, asked me if I would say a few words um, about the um, 50th anniversary of the passage of this act. The National Association of Realtors President Elizabeth Mendenhall wrote the following in the March-April issue of Realtor Magazine. April 11th marks the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Federal Fair Housing Act. Since the right to own property and to own a home is the foundation of our business, it does mark a major milestone in the real estate business. The Fair Housing Act prohibits discrimination based on race, color, national origin, religion, sex, familial status, or disability. The National Association of Realtors incorporates those, require, those requirements as well as, the, as equal opportunity on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. Those are molded into our code of ethics. And it's so because it makes our association stronger, our industry, and our country stronger. So in commemoration of the Fair Housing Act, our commemoration of the Fair Housing Act is vital because it highlights how far we've come in promoting equal opportunity, both as a society, as an association, and more importantly, how much, the work, how much more work still needs to be done. And I thought that that summed it up perfectly. But what I was equally impressed with is what she wrote in the following paragraph, which is, what is essential to acknowledge is National Association of Realtors' past role in opposing fair housing law. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. invoked the words of the abolitionist Theodore Parker when he said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. The National Association of Realtors past opposition to fair housing law is a period in our association's history that we must own, we must learn from it, and we must ensure that realtors are on the right side of history moving forward. Housing is not a special interest, it's a human right. As a realtor, I am guided daily by its provisions, but long before the act became professionally relevant, the lack of a legal mandate with respect to equal housing opportunities had effect on my personal life. In 1958, my family was one of the first four or five African American families to move into what is known as Shepherd Edition. It's a neighborhood just near the corner of East Fifth Avenue and Sunbury Road. My first year at Shepherd Elementary School, there were 15 or so black kids in the school. The following year, there were 20 white kids that were left after full-fledged white flight, which in part was spurred by realtors telling people that a colored family just bought down the block, you should sell now. It was classic blockbusting. The second incident that I want to share occurred when I was a freshman at Eastmore High School. My parents had one car and thought it would be much more convenient if I could walk to school. So a realtor picked up my mother, my stepfather, my sister, and I and took us to see a house located on Wyatt Avenue, the same street at which the high school is located. We were walking up the sidewalk, and the front door swings open, and a man appears and says, oh, no, 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 I'm not selling the coloreds, and slams the door. We all stopped in our tracks, turned around, and went back home in total silence. It's difficult to describe the weight of the mantle of indignity that's heaped upon one because of the color of your skin or your national origin or any other protected class. The passage of this act was a hard-fought victory in the ongoing war against injustice and discrimination. The Fair Housing Act contributes to the memorialization of the constitutional proclamation that all men are created equal. 
There is still much work to be done, and I certainly hope that we'll all keep up the good fight. Thank you. We do have a uh, speaker uh, this evening on this topic before we vote in the proclamation. David Harwood, Harewood. Good evening. And I have uh, written copies for all of you as well. Council Member Emanuel Remy is ceremoniously honoring the Fair Housing Act today. That would be a fine declaration if it weren't riddled with irony. The Upper Arlington Market featured in Mr. Remy's Coldwell Banker professional profile is over 90% white. The average household sells for 345000 Zach Klein, in whose seat Mr. Remy was recently appointed, lives in Clintonville, also near 90% white, with a slightly lower market value than Mr. Remy's client base. The city attorney has spent much of March tweeting about the raids that the city's been coordinating on drug houses in the west side and in Linden. The fourth drug house shut down was in Westgate, 67% white, 12% black, with an average home value of 140,000. Emanuel lives in 43224, which is at about half and a half. His home value is marked well above market for the area. The only person who was living in a place that's at risk was Council President Hardin, who recently moved into King Lincoln, which is currently being gentrified. At the beginning of the year, Borer and Associates of the Dublin area and Kingsley Properties of Cincinnati acquired that lot across the street from the Lincoln Theater in his new neighborhood. The deal was sweetened in this hall by hefty contributions from Borer to many of the recent re-election campaigns in the previous cycle, and softened to the public by the advent of Kingsley's owner, a black man who grew up in Columbus. In the meantime, I was at a meeting last, uh, a meeting last October convened by James Ragland, who'd been hired by the city to, in his words, quote, get the Near East Side ready for gentrification, quote. Every, not a single member of this body lives in an American area affected by the side effects of housing discrimination, arguably being carried out by members of this body in subtle ways. <clears throat> the option for people to say implement rehabilitation of viable housing and work solutions to the current lock them up or move them out method currently in use fails to address problems like these. Now, in fact, Issue three encourages said propagation. Mr. Remy's appointment, tied as he is in the private sector to some of the best real estate in the Columbus area with all of the potential for fundraising that comes with it, ensures that the people best served by the current system will keep it in place. So while you make this proclamation honoring the Fair Housing Act, know that many in this city are without homes, most of them black and few of them think they have a voice within their government. It's up to those of us who have voices to keep reminding you that they exist. This body consistently fails to do it and throws flimsily constructed solutions to the people's problems. There has to be a better way. Neither this proclamation nor the issue three offer a single tangible solution to problems that people of color and the people of the poor in this city face. Thank you. I'd like to thank the speaker for coming down this evening. Do are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Councilmember Tyson. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Councilmember um, Remy. I know you just mentioned the, the Near East Side neighborhood, yeah. and, and so I, I just want to just, I want to clarify something. I can't speak on what comments that Mr. Ragland stated. Mr. Ragland's charge was to work within the Near East Side to work with the community, to work to find out what, need, what are the needs within the community. And so based upon that, excuse me, mm -hmm. based upon that, 
This is interesting because just today we were having some conversations based upon some of that work and the report from there. And it clearly is about this, this, and the study came about so that we can have some clarification, was based upon what was um, the issues that were going on with the neighborhood house. And based upon the neighborhood house and the issues there, there, was a, there has been work done to ensure that one, we continue to have um, services to meet the needs of the community, and additionally, to ask the community through various different ways we've been working with the neighborhoods to find out what are the services that the community needs. And it is not the question about gentrification. So that was not, I mean, I don't know what you heard from him, but the study was not about how do we gentrify this neighborhood. It was about what services are needed since the loss of the neighborhood house. So that's, that's you know, one issue that I just want to make sure that we just clarify, just I appreciate you coming and sharing your, whatever, sharing your thoughts, but we also have to make sure that happens. The other issue in regards to um, the project that is going to be on Long Street, of course you know that's Next Gen's project and that they have a board and they have, um, and so based upon that, just making sure that I think you have a communication with Next Gen around what happened to the McNabb property. So I, I just want to, when you come down, it is important that you, we give you an opportunity to share your thoughts, but you also have to make sure that when there are inaccuracies, that we definitely clear those up. So I thank you for coming down and sharing your thoughts with us. Those were the words he used, verbatim. Certainly, if that were the words that he used, I will personally want to ask him to use those words. But that is not, I mean, that, was, that is not what that project is about. Thank you. Would any, any of my colleagues have any other questions about the resolution? Well, first to say, um, thanks for coming down and, and, and we've heard your, your comments. So you can take your seat. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, just to your, to your point, I don't want to, to lose fact on what you just recognized. The, the Fair Housing um, Act um, that uh, made ways for folks to, uh, that look like um, many members of this council to diversify and to build the communities that we live in. Um, the work that um, is ever yet going on. Uh, and um, I appreciate the work that, that so many have, have done, the work that is continuing um, to go on, and I appreciate you uh, uh, highlighting that resolution th this evening. All right, thank you very much. If there's no further comments, I move for passage. Yeah. Clerk, call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hart. Passed. Is that all, Councilmember Remy? Councilmember Page. Thank you, President Hardin. This evening, I have two resolutions, the first one being 0062X-2018, to honor and recognize the work of Caroline N. Bennett, an inspiring young professional for the service that she has rendered to her community. Uh, Ms. Bennett is not able to join us this evening, but I would like to move for adoption of this resolution. Second. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. And the second resolution I have is 0097X-2018. And I would like to ask um, Mo with Rama Consulting and anyone with him this evening to come down to the podium to recognize the exceptional business acumen of Rama Consulting and to congratulate Rama on their 15th anniversary. And just to read a few of Mo Wright's accomplishments. Mo Wright, president and CEO of Rama, earned a BA in political science and master's degrees in public administration and workforce development. He has extensive experience in assessment needs, strategic communications, executive group facilitation, and is rated as a master trainer. And Rama, which is founded in 2003, has developed a stellar reputation of excellence and integrity while servicing its customers. The Rama mission statement is consulting partners with diverse individuals and organizations to inspire their optimal performance and successful outcomes. And Rama is a proud recipient of the Medical Mutual Pillar Award presented by Smart Business for Outstanding Community Involvement. 
RAMA contributes time and resources towards entities such as the United Way of Central Ohio, American Red Cross, the Columbus Foundation, the Columbus Metropolitan Library, and the City of Columbus. And I would now like to move for adoption of this resolution. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy Stenziano, Tyson, President Harden. And Mo, the floor is now yours. Thank you, uh, Council President Harden, uh, Council Member Page, members of council. First of all, thank you for honoring this 15-year uh, journey of mine. Uh, it's been a, uh, just that, a journey, and, and I'm so thankful to members of this city council. Uh, you all know us. We are your partners in so much work in this city, and uh, we have worked together on so many important issues, and we'll continue to do that. Uh, I think about uh, when my office started here 15 years ago, right down the street, and um, as a dream, quite honestly, an experiment to see if uh, a, a young colored African-American boy from uh, Eastern North Carolina could uh, come to a city like Columbus and try to uh, turn it into something that works for him. And it's not lost on me that, you know, a week after, less than a week after Dr. King's um, 50th anniversary of his assassination, at the end of his life, he was talking about economic inclusion. Mm -hmm. He was talking about an America where all of us had an opportunity to share in that great American dream that often gets missed by some members of our community. So I'm proud to stand here as an example. Uh, Columbus has been a great environment to grow RAMA. Uh, you all have been a great partner to us. Uh, our work and, and with these guys and so many others on our team do each and every day is difficult work. It's developing teams and organizations that might not understand where they need to go or where their employees uh, might need to be supported. It's uh, difficult issues in the community when you all call and say, hey, I've got an issue on a certain sector of town and we need to get some consensus built. It's messy uh, work that doesn't always get the limelight, but it's important work to making sure that this really is uh, America's opportunity city. So we're proud to be in a city like Columbus. We're proud of, uh, to be a good partner with all of you. Uh, I thank my wife and, and my children who uh, lend me to service for this community quite often, and uh, we look forward to continue to be a great partner with these guys and so many others on important work for this city. So thank you, Councilmember Page, for this great recognition, and we look forward to continue to work together. Thank you so much. Are there any additional comments from my colleagues? Again, congratulations on your anniversary. President Pro Tem. Thank you, President Harden. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, announcement, remind everyone about what, as I age, is becoming one of my favorite weeks. Uh, this week is National Retirement Planning Week, a national effort to help consumers focus on their financial needs and retirement. It's a week-long celebration, and throughout National Retirement Planning Week, educational materials will be, made available, will be made available in conjunction with the week's agenda, and the National Retirement Planning Coalition will encourage retirement planning through nationally distributed print, radio materials, a coordinated media outreach program, and events throughout the week. While these events are concentrated during this week every year, the ideas and resources offered are intended to have a long-lasting impact. And as the work that we've done through Age Friendly, this was an item that often came up. Uh, the goal of this week is to promote the importance of comprehensive retirement planning. So I encourage everyone here and at home to visit www.retireonyourterms.org, which features life stage specific resources and tools to help people focus on our long-term financial goals. Again, this website is www.retireonyourterms.org, and happy National Retirement Planning Week. Next, I'd like to introduce resolution 0102X-2018, to recognize and celebrate the 2017-2018 Columbus Afrocentric Lady Nubians basketball team for winning the Ohio Division III state championship this year. Unfortunately, Coach McKinney and the team were not able to come down this evening, uh, but we will be coordinating the opportunity to present the resolution. Uh, but we'd like to pass it tonight, and with that, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Harden. Adopted. Thank you. And finally, I would like to invite Christine Brown from the Nysonger Center at The Ohio State University to the podium as I introduce resolution 0103X-2018 to recognize April as Autism Awareness Month and encourage residents to learn more about autism and its effect on our community. The Center for Disease Control determined that approximately one in 68 children in the United States have autism. And with so many affected community members, it's important to build support systems and provide resources for children and adults with the disorder and their family members. Many organizations throughout Columbus provide specialized schooling and therapy for children and adults with autism and often exist as nonprofits, meaning they rely on donations and support to effectively serve those with developmental disabilities in our community. 
Through Autism Awareness Month, we hope to educate the community about the issues faced by people on the spectrum and their families. So it's my honor to welcome Christine back. Uh, I will turn the podium over to you and then we will pass it once your comments are done. Thank you, uh, Michael Stunziano and all of City Council. Um, as Michael said, my name is Christine Brown. I've been here before and I know that we all want to support people with autism because like Michael Stinziano said, there's one in 68. Um, over at the Ohio State University Nysonger Center, I'd like you all to know that last year marked the 50th anniversary since it was created. We had, you said, University Centers of Excellence in Developmental Disabilities all over the United States, but Nysonger here in Columbus has been active for 50 years last year. And we do have an autism clinic designed for young children through adults um, with autism. And I have some brochures here to give to you all. Um, we even have programs like Aspirations. That's a program for young adults, uh, the teen group, 13 through 18, and then, or 17, then 18 through 25 young adults trying to know what's the path they want to go in their life. Um, we also do behavior support and other programs and have coordinated the Next Chapter Book Club as well. So um, you could go on to nysonger.osu.edu and I have these handouts here that I'll give. Uh, another thing that I'd like to say while I'm here is that April 18th, um, the Nysonger Center will be vending with a lot of providers, even including the Autism Society of Greater Columbus and um, other organizations for the Franklin County Provider Fair. One thing we're doing this year because the provider, we have such a provider shortage here in Ohio because the salary that we they get and one thing we've done is we put on indeed.com that one to four they have a chance to go anyone trying to get a job could go to that provider fair and try to see about work and win something so it's like come and get a job and try to win a lottery <laughs> like that so that's uh, what we're doing, and so I want to thank for coming down here today. Thank you, Christine. You are always welcome at Chambers, and we really appreciate your ongoing advocacy uh, and your uh, comments and support for so many throughout our community. Do any of my colleagues have questions or comments? Seeing none, I'll move for adoption. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Harden. Adopt it. Thank you. Councilmember Tyson. Thank you so very much. And I am going to ask if um, Samin and um, Mr. March <clears throat> Marcello Canova, please come to the podium. And it is and Samin Defar from Sister Columbus Sister Cities. The resolution 0110X-2018. It's to honors and celebrate and thank Marcello Canova for representing the City of Columbus at the seventh annual 2018 Pesto World Championship in Genoa, Italy. Whereas classic pesto is customarily made with crushed pine nuts, garlic, basil, olive oil, and Parmesan, 
and Parmesan, a tradition that dates back to the ancient Rome. Whereas Marcello Canova, the 2017 Columbus Italian Festival champion, was given the opportunity to represent the city of Columbus at the seventh annual 2018 Pesto World Comp World Championship in Genoa, Italy on Saturday, se uh, March 17th of 2018. Whereas the Pesto World Championship fo founded in 2007 um, by Roberto Paninza, a Genovese restaurant, restauranteur who, fe who feared the tradition of using a stone mortar and wooden pesto to make pesto was disappearing. Whereas the annual World Pesto Championship has become one of the signature events and cultural highlights of the city of Genoa. And whereas the event featured 100 competitors from around the world, and whereas the city of Columbus is proud of its 64-year collaboration with the city of Genoa, its first and oldest sister city, Whereas the city expresses its appreciation to Columbus Sister Cities International on its partnership, advocacy, engagement, and cultural exchange, ultimately enhancing the quality of life for Columbus and Central Ohio residents. And whereas Marcello Canova, a 40-year-old Ohio State University professor, born and raised in northern, in northern Italy, held his own against competitors from around the world during his 30-minute challenge. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Council of the City of Columbus, this council is hereby honor, celebrate, and thank Marcello Canova for representing the City of Columbus at the 7th Annual 2018 World Pesto Championship in Genoa, Italy. I move for adoption. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stanziano, Tyson, President Harden. All right, the floor is yours. And if Samina, if you're going to speak first or... Marcello, you going to speak? Well, of course. As a born Italian, food is very important to me, right? <laughs> but uh, despite of this, uh, as uh, Council Member Tyson was mentioning, uh, the collaboration between Genova and the city of Columbus goes back a very long time. And since, you know, for Italians, food and cooking traditions are a very important part of our nation, our families, sharing this tradition with the city of Columbus is a testament to the connection between these two cities. So I've happened to be a very fortunate person at a very, uh, very good time to participate to this competition and, uh, and win the Pesto Championship in Genoa. And this gave us the opportunity to uh, be invited to Genoa, spend a weekend there. Uh, we got to meet uh, the mayor of the city uh, and the city council. And uh, that's where I actually wore my hat of Ohio State University professor. And, uh, we had an excellent meeting. It was a very immediate, very strong connection. There is so much synergy between, the, uh, between us, and uh, we were able to have a very good discussions, plan several initiatives, exchange, uh, arts exchanges, cultural exchanges, and definitely strengthen the relationship between the two cities as well as between the two universities. So what started with a mortar and pesto, I hope that uh, is going to continue to flourish into a stronger bond between the city of Columbus and the city of Genoa. Thank you, and I'd just like to take this moment to thank you all for your support, particularly Council Member Tyson, who has been a champion for the Genoa Exchanges. It's our first sister city, and we are so excited to build off of what happened this year in Genoa and see future programs come out of what happened. And thank you again, Marcello, for making really great pesto and getting us over there. So thank you all so much. Thank you, and um, tonight, uh, I think on consent, there is some legislation to support the um, Greater Columbus Citrus Seeds International, and I'm excited about that. It's not in my committee, I think it's in the development committee. But again, this is what happens when you have an organization that is focused on arts and culture um, with Sister Seeds across the, across the world. And um, certainly, the relationship, as uh, Marcello just mentioned, would be strengthened with the Ohio State University, which I think will be a really great one. And so again, thank you for representing us and being such a uh, great champion for the city, Marcello, and I have a resolution for you. Thank you.
my next resolution, I am going to ask uh, Principal Mitchell, Coach Jenkins, and um, Coach Walker, and all the young ladies that are here representing the Berwick Alternative Girls Basketball Team. <coughs> Walk up, come to the podium. And this resolution, a number 0114X-2018, is to honor, recognize, and to celebrate the Berwick Alternative Girls Basketball Team on winning the Columbus City Schools, Columbus City Schools Middle School Girls Basketball Championship. Whereas the City of Columbus and the members of Columbus City Council are always proud to honor and to celebrate the youth of this community as they represent the life and future prosperity of our city. Whereas Berwick Alternative K-8 through is a STEAM-focused school where all who enter are valued, engaged, challenged, and aspire to be lifelong learners, high achievers, and socially responsible global, le global leaders. Whereas Berwick is a place where excellent students are rooted in a tradition of family and community, and students are challenged through their high quality, data-informed, innovative lessons designed to meet student needs, encouraged to explore, to be flexible, and to be independent, empowered to be collaborators, creators, communicators, and critical thinkers. And whereas Berwick's 2017-18 theme, Imagine, Event, and Inspire, and the motto of We Learn, We Achieve, and We Lead, is an outline of who they are and what they represent. Whereas the Berwick Alternative Girls basketball team, under the leadership of Principal Mitchell and head coach Jenkins, and the support of parents, teachers, administrators, and others cheering and encouraging their development, successfully engaged in and won the 2018 Columbus City Schools, Gr Columbus City Schools Girls Middle School Basketball Championship. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Council of the City of Columbus that this council is hereby honor, recognize, and celebrate the Berwick Alternative Girls Basketball Team on winning the Columbus City Schools middle school girls basketball championship. I move for adoption. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Harden. Thank you. If the parents want to come up and take photos, you can come around. I know you're taking photos there. You're welcome to come up and take a few pictures. <laughs> All right. Ms. You said it all, I tell you. I want to thank all of the city council members for this outstanding honor. These young ladies will always cherish this moment. It has been a privilege to serve as their coach, and this group of ladies are young scholars as well as athletes. They maintain honor status throughout the very long basketball season. I want to personally thank the parents who have been positive role models in the lives of their children, and our very outstanding positive leader, Mrs. Bitchu. Thanks to her, we had we got this thing done. I want to thank my assistant coach, Coach Walker. Come on in, Coach Walker. He helped out a lot and made the difference. The girls worked hard for some five-day weeks, and I am so proud of each and every one of them. Um, I would also like to say that the young ladies you see standing here now, these are your role models. You're going to see these young ladies in a positive manner in the, in the near future. And I just want to give them a big round of applause. <laughs> and without further ado, I would like to introduce our team, Brooke Barnes. Oh, um, thank you. Thanks. See, Let's I go a long way back with uh, Sister Tyson here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, let, what about the principal up, first? Let's let, let the principal, do you want to say something, Miss Ms. Mitchell? I want you to say it. Thank you. It's such an honor to be here. As our motto, we learn, we lead, we achieve. In everything they do, these young ladies are our role models at our school. And I appreciate every single one of them, and they know that. I'm always in their fans, loud as screaming, quietly, sometimes off to the side, but I'm always in their corner. So you will see them in the future. Thank you. And um, Mr. Walker, do you want to say anything? Real briefly, our motto we had was leave nothing on the court. They did a great job this year. Good job, ladies. 
All right. And tell us what gra your name and what grade you're in. Hi. My name is Brooke Barnes. I'm in eighth grade. I plan to be a radiologist when I grow up. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Samaya Hill, and I want to be a civil justice lawyer when I grow up. And I'm in eighth grade. Hi, my name is Kavana Leeper, and I'm in eighth grade, and I want to be a dental hygienist. Hi, I'm Zaria Anderson. I'm in eighth grade, and I want to be a dance teacher. Hi, my name is Michaela Walker. I'm in eighth grade, and I want to be a nurse, and I want to be in the WMEA. Hello, my name is Jaden Carter, and I'm in seventh grade, and I want to be a doctor. Hi, my name is Ariel, I'm a, and I'm in seventh grade, and I want to be a doctor. Hi, my name is Jada Bailey. I'm in eighth grade, and I want to be a teacher. Thank you, um, Ms. Mitchell, um, Coach Jenkins, and Coach Walker. Thank you for the work that you do each and every day to support these young ladies at Berwick Alternative Middle School. I also want to say a special thank you to the parents because when you are in middle school, your parents have to drive you back and forth, pick oh, you up. Yes. And so I want to say thank you to the parents because I know it's not always easy, but certainly um, hearing the grade point averages, also these young ladies learning about teamwork and winning. And I thank you for allowing your daughters to be in this program. And to the young ladies, I want you to continue to do positive things, continue to, to work together. You absolutely are our future and we thank you for that continue to listen to your parents listen to your coaches but you are absolutely stars and there isn't anything that you cannot accomplish just know that there's nothing that you cannot accomplish and I'm so proud of each and every one of you are there any comments from my colleagues seeing none again thank you very much and I have the resolution and each of you will also be getting a separate a certificate coming to your school with your name on it because we think that it's important that you also each individually have a, um, uh, a certificate of achievement. Thank you. Are there any comments uh, from our elected officials, Madam Auditor, C City Treasurer, City Attorney's Office, the judges, the courthouse is not here. Um, are there any requests by members of council for the removal of ordinance uh, resolutions from the consent action portion of the agenda? Seeing none, may we now have a motion to waive reading of the titles of the 30-day legislation by the city clerk? Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Harden. Will the clerk now read into the record the ordinance numbers of 30-day legislation on tonight's agenda for first reading? Finance Committee, Ordinance 833-845-2018, Recreation and Parks Committee, Ordinance 839-2018, Public Service and Transportation Committee, Resolution 74X-2018, and Ordinance 934-2018, Public Utilities Committee, Ordinances 858, 864, 882, 894, and 937 dash 2018 Zoning Committee, Ordinances 952, 986, 988, and 991-2018. The following ordinances appear on our agenda as consent actions. Will the clerk now read those ordinances uh, into the record, please? Resolutions of Expression 104, 105, 107, 108, 109, 111, 112, and 101 X 2018 Finance Committee. Ordinances 801, 805, 817, 834, 836, 879, and 945 2018. Recreation and Parks Committee. Ordinances 772 and 915 2018. Public Safety Committee. Ordinance, uh, Ordinance 881 2018. Public Service and Transportation Committee. Ordinances 790. 835, 837, and 856 2018. Administration Committee, Ordinance 842 2018. Economic Development and Small Business Committee, Ordinances 851, 871, 874, 875, 876, 877, and 926 2018. Housing Committee, Ordinances 846, 878, 977, 978. 
979, 980, and 981-2018. Judiciary and Court Administration Committee, Ordinance 919-2018. Technology Committee, Ordinances 424 and 832-2018. Public Utilities Committee, Ordinances 705, 709, 739, 752, 754, 782, 799, 825, 831-2018, Health and Human Services Committee, Ordinances 819 and 870-2018, and appointments from the Mayor's Office numbered A0091, 92, and 93-2018. Thank you, Madam Clerk. There are no speakers on the agenda for consent. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, may I have a uh, motion for approval of the items designated consent? Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardy. Consent agenda is passed. We will now proceed with the second reading of 30-day tabled and emergency legislation. The first committee uh, before council this evening is the uh, Finance Committee. Council Member Elizabeth Brown is chair. Council Member, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Hardin. Tonight in finance, we have one ordinance, 0895-2018 to authorize the city auditor to modify the existing contracts with Tyler Technologies Incorporated and Microsoft Corporation and provide funding for the support, hosting, and maintenance of Dynamics AX to authorize the appropriation and expenditure of up to $770,000 from the Special Income Tax Fund and expenditure of $302,059 from the General Fund for a total expenditure of $1,072,059 and to declare an emergency. This ordinance authorizes the city auditor to provide funding for the support and hosting of the city's financial management system. The ordinance allows the extension of the contract for up to two additional years funded annually and subject to appropriation by council in order to continue operations without interruption and while the city plans its migration strategy to a newer version of the product. Once the city has determined the new version is ready to support the financial management needs of the city, new legislation would initiate the move and an RFP would be conducted for an implementation partner. Are there any questions from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Brown, Brown, Paige, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. That's all I have in my committees, thank you. Thank you, Chair Brown. The next committee to come before council is a safety committee. Uh, council Member Mitchell Brown chairs that committee. Council Member, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Hardin. Uh, tonight, uh, we have uh, 0865-2018 to authorize the finance and management director to enter into a contract on behalf of the Office of Construction and Management with Moody Nolan for professional services related to the design of Fire Station 16 and to authorize the expenditure of $900, $902,000 from the Safety Voted Bond Fund and to declare an emergency. If there are no questions, I move for passage. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. That's all we have in public safety. Thank you, President. Thank you, Chair Brown. The next committee to come before council is the Public Service and Transportation Committee. And the committee is chaired by Council Member Remy. Council Member, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Hardin. I'd like to uh, introduce tonight's um, on second reading 0780-2018 to authorize the city auditor to appropriate grant funds within the general government grants fund to authorize the director of public service to enter into a construction guaranteed maximum reimbursement agreement with Ohio Health in an amount up to of up to $1.5 million for the Ohio Health Boulevard project and to declare an emergency. Are there any questions and comments or comments from my colleagues? If not, I move for adoption. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. Secondly, I'd like to um, bring up 0823-2018 to authorize the appropriation of funds in the Smart City Grant Fund to authorize the Chief Innovation Officer to execute and professional services contract with Michael Baker International relative to the Smart City Challenge Professional Support Services Project to authorize the expenditure of up to two two million one hundred twenty five thousand from the smart city grant fund and to declare an emergency i'd like to um, invite up brandy ron to speak on this topic this evening and i want to thank council president hardin for his diligent work and our cooperative work on this particular project um, brandy 
Yeah. Good evening, Chairman Sorry. Remy and <laughs> Council President Hardin, members of Council. <laughs> bad joke. Uh, the <laughs> legislation before you tonight would allow us to enter into contract with Michael Baker International. The firm would provide a number of services to our Smart Columbus program office, including uh, project management uh, and then some expertise in intelligent transportation systems and systems engineering process management. Thank you very much. Yeah. Are there any comments from my que or questions from my colleagues this evening? Seeing none, I move for passage. Thank you. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Paige, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. Next, I have ordinance number 0951-2018 to authorize the Director of Department of Finance and Management to enter into a contract with the Ohio Department of Transportation and yet to be named vendors for the purchase of rock salt based on the terms of a cooperative purchase contract to be established by ODOT to authorize the Director of Finance and Management to establish purchase orders for rock salt to authorize the expenditure of $1,800,000 from the Municipal Motor Vehicle License Tax Fund, $7,500 from the Sewage Oper Systems Operating Fund, and 41,250 from the Water Systems Operating Fund, 3,600 from the Electricity Systems Operating Fund, to authorize the Director of Finance and Management to associate all general budget reservations resulting from this ordinance with the appropriate contract purchase agreement for Rock Salt and to declare an emergency. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues this evening? Hearing none, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Paige, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. That's all I have in public service and transportation. Now I'd like to move into environment. Please. Thank you. Tonight I introduce 067-2018 to authorize the expenditure of $3,314,435 from the appropriated balance of the street construction maintenance and repair fund to authorize the Director of Public Service to renew the contract with Rumpke of Ohio, Inc. for yard waste and recycling collection services to authorize, excuse me, the expenditure of $5,415,565 from the general fund for the second year of the contract and to declare an emergency. Using Rumpke of Ohio allows Columbus residents to pay considerably less for recycling yard waste pickup than other cities in our region. The average cost per household in the city of Columbus to pick up recyclables every other week in yard waste is 85 cents with Rumpke. The city of Columbus pays a lower price for recycling than Cincinnati and Newport, Kentucky. Cincinnati households pay $2.20 every other week for recycling and Newport residents pay $2.61 every other week. For Bexley, Westerville, Blendon Township, and Genoa Township, their residents spend about $2.37 per household every other week on recycling and yard waste pickup. The city of Columbus residents pay a total of $1.70 per household every other week on recycling and yard waste pickup. Although Columbus residents pay considerably less for recycling and yard waste pickup, the Department of Public Service and Transportation and I will continue to look for lower costs on behalf of taxpayers and residents. I'd like to throw it over to the Director of Public Service to also comment on it. Thank you, Chair Remy, Council President Hard, and other members of Council. I would just like to add a couple other facts. This program allows us to continue to divert waste from the Swake, the landfill owned and operated by Swaco. In 2017, this program allowed us to divert 32,685 tons of residential waste from the landfill through the recycling portion of the contract, and we diverted 23,011 tons of yard waste from the landfill for this contract. Um, so that's all I have, unless anybody has questions for me. Councilmember Brown. Director, just one question again. I know you're always pursuing, or are you always pursuing, other alternatives with regards to recycling. We, I love the recycling program. We need to figure out how we can try to do more recycling than what we currently are doing uh, based on what is available from a financial perspective. I would agree with that, um, Council Member Brown. And one of the things that we are currently working on is trying to get a grant that we will be bringing um, to Council for approval here soon. We're trying to go after a grant with Swaco where we can do some analysis on where we are strong with recycling, where we are not strong, uh, materials that we could perhaps find other ways to recycle. Um, and so we will be working on trying to get that grant. And as we go through that grant, also looking at the public perception or the public education piece of it as well. Again, how do we educate people on what can and can't be recycled again to try to drive those numbers higher? 
I would only say again, an educational campaign to continue to inform the residents of Columbus how important it is to recycle and the value associated with recycling. So thank you. Thank you. Council Member Cinziano. Thank you, Chair. And I don't know if a question for you or the director, but the numbers that we cited were provided a year ago with what the contract was. And this contract actually asks for more. So how do those numbers, are we doing less service now? How do those numbers still equal the same if we're paying more for the services this year? So each year in the contract that we signed last year with Rumpke, every year the cost escalates a little bit for additional um, cost of them doing business. And that was in the original contract. Is that what you were asking? I'm sorry. Are the residents of the city of Columbus oh. still paying on average $1.70 for recyclable and yard pickup if the contract's worth more? It averages about that based on we also have additional households every year adding to the Columbus. I don't have the exact math, but it, it averages about the same, roughly. Okay, Council Member Brown. I was just saying, because I was the chair last year, the numbers were for the overall contract. So the contract is what obligates us to the annual payment. And when they did the household breakdown, it was for the overall contract. So even though each year looks different, it's based on numbers from the five-year contract. So, and I apologize, um, as I've talked with the chair, there wasn't a briefing to us beforehand, but I get it's for the five-year average, but that five-year average took into account that we're gonna increase for each of the years coming forward. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments from my colleagues? If not, I move for passage by voice vote. Clerk, call the roll by voice. Ms. Brown? Mr. Brown? Yes. Page? Yes. Remy? Yes. Stinziano? Yes. Tyson? Yes. President Hardin? Yes. Ordinance pass. Thank you, President Hardin and my colleagues. That's all I have tonight in environment. Thank you, Chair Remy. The next committee to come before council is the Economic Development and Small and Minority Business Committee. Council Member Jaisa Page is chair. Council Member, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Harding. This evening we have Ordinance 0852-2018 to authorize the Director of the Department of Development to enter into an Enterprise Zone Agreement with KDL Properties LLC and Fortner Upholstering Incorporated for a tax abatement of 75% for a period of 10 consecutive years in consideration of a total proposed capital investment of approximately $2.3 million, the retention of 37 full-time jobs, and the creation of six new full-time permanent positions with an estimated annual payroll of approximately $237,000. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Any comments from the director? Seeing none, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. 0872 2018. To authorize the Director of Development to enter into a contract with the Capital Crossroads Special Improvement District of Columbus, Incorporated, for the implementation of services set forth in the district plan. To authorize and direct the city auditor to appropriate and expend up to $3,100,000 from assessments levied from property owners and to declare an emergency. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Clerk, call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President, Hardin. Ordinance passed. 0873-2018, to authorize the Director of Development to enter into a contract with the Discovery Special Improvement District of Columbus, Incorporated, for the implementation of services set forth in the district plan, to direct the city auditor to appropriate and expend up to $1 million from assessments levied from property owners and to declare an emergency. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. What's your second? Clerk, call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Dreamy, Stenziano, Tyson, President, Hardin. Pass. 0889-2018, to authorize the Director of the Department of Development on behalf of the city to enter into a tax increment financing agreement with Lifestyle Communities Limited to provide for the construction and financing of public infrastructure improvements within and around the tax <coughs> increment financing areas created by Ordinance 2117-2005 and to declare an emergency. Are there any additional comments from the director? Seeing none. There are no questions or comments from my colleagues. I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. 
Brown, Brown, Paige, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Harden. Passed. And my final piece this evening, 0940-2018, to authorize the Director of the Department of Development to enter into contract with Rev1 Ventures for the purpose of administering the Entrepreneurial Signature Program, to authorize the expenditure of $250,000 from a 2018 General Fund operating budget and to declare an emergency. <coughs> if there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Second. Is there a second? Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Paige, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. Thank you, President Hardin. That's all I have. Thank you, Chair Page. The next committee to come before council is the Technology uh, Committee. President Pro Tem Cinziano is chair. President Pro Tem, this floor is yours. Thank you, President Hardin. Tonight in technology, bring forward ordinance 0908-2018 to authorize the director of the Department of Technology to enter into contracts with Vertif Services Incorporated for annual maintenance and related services associated with the uninterrupted power supply systems in accordance with the sole source provisions of the Columbus City Code. And to authorize the director of the Department of Technology to enter into contract with Vertif Services Incorporated for heating, cooling, and ventilation systems, various equipment maintenance, to authorize the contingency funds to waive the competitive bidding provisions of the Columbus City Code, to authorize the expenditure of $150,000, 850830 $73.19 from the Department of Technology, Information Services Division, Information Services Operating Fund, and declare an emergency. Uh, as a result of various systems and equipment troubleshooting within the Department of Technology, the department, under the leadership of the director, has selected one comprehensive vendor with the expertise to manage all equipment under one umbrella contract. Previously, there were five separate vendors and contracts performing routine maintenance and support services, which is neither cost effective nor efficient. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Paige, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Harden. Pass. We can move to utilities. Please. Tonight, utilities bring forward ordinance 0699-2018 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to modify and increase an existing professional services agreement with HR Grain Associates Incorporated for the Wastewater Treatment Facilities Professional Construction Management Contract Mode Number 1 to authorize the transfer within of $5,927,651 43 cents from the expenditure of up to six million four hundred fifty one thousand three hundred eighty five dollars and 43 cents from the sanitary sewer general obligation bond fund and to amend the 2017 capital improvements budget the contract provides construction administration and management services including construction inspection construction startup coordination reporting budgeting scheduling document tracking and related tasks for multiple projects within the department this is a five-year contract which commenced in 2017 and is planned to end with the closeout of the final project added in the final contract modification of 2021. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Paige, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. Next, Ordinance 0746-2018. Twenty eighteen to authorize the director of public utilities to modify and increase an existing professional engineering services agreement with Arcadis US Incorporated for the HAP Cremian Water Plant and Dublin Road Water Plant Standby Power Projects for the Division of Water. To authorize a transfer and expenditure up to three million one hundred and fifty dollars from the Water General Obligations Voted Bonds Fund and to amend the twenty seventeen capital improvements budget. This project will provide standby power generators at Hap Cremian Water Plant and Dublin Road Water Plant and will allow the plants to continue operation during a utility power outage, thereby improving the reliability of the water supply system. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Okay. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Paige, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. Next, Ordinance 0756-2018 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to renew an existing engineering agreement with DLZ Ohio for the Lower Olentangy Tunnel Phase 1 and 2 to transfer within $5,132,528.64 and expend up to $5,402,729.42 from the Sanitary Sewer General Obligation Bond Fund and to amend the 2017 Capital Improvements Budget for the Division of Sewer and Drainage. The proposed Lower Olentangy Tunnel will work in tandem with the four pillars of the Blueprint Columbus Program to enable the city to address several elements of its sewer consent orders. The project will provide hydraulic relief to both the Franklin Main Interceptor Sewer and the Olentangy Scioto Interceptor Sewer near 2nd Avenue and near Doddridge. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Paige, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Harden. 
And the final ordinance, 0785-2018, to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to pay the State of Ohio Treasurer Department of Natural Resources for operation and maintenance services and water entitlement costs for withdrawing water from the Alum Creek Reservoir for the Division of Water and the authorized expenditure of $1,298,643.40 from the Water Operating Fund. This agreement was entered into in 1971. An annual payment is needed to keep the agreement in effect. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. Thank you, President Hardin. That's all we have on my committees this evening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The final committee to come before council is the Health and Human Services Committee. The committee is chaired by Councilmember Tyson. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Hardin. I'm going to ask Sarah Loken from the Community Shelter Board to walk towards the podium, please. The first ordinance is going to be 0867-2018 to authorize the Director of the Department of Development to enter into a contract with the Community Shelter Board for the purpose of continuing the city's support of the safety net program for homeless emergency shelters related homeless shelter services and homelessness prevention and transition services to authorize expenditure of two million eight hundred and forty seven thousand two hundred fifty eight dollars from the general fund and to declare an emergency Ms. Loken the floor is yours thank you good evening um, council member Tyson council president Hardin and all members of council I'm Sarah Loken with community shelter board your long-standing investment in community shelter board is an investment in 16 different agencies that deliver deliver services to more than 12,000 people in Columbus every year. With your support, we are overseeing dozens of programs this year that keep people safe, help them get back into housing, and help them get back on the road to self-sufficiency. The proposed safety net legislation supports um, the homeless hotline, uh, the network of emergency shelters, as well as rapid rehousing programs that serve literally thousands of people every year. Thank you. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Brown, Brown, Paige, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Thank Hardin. You. Thank you. And the next ordinance is 0869-2018 to authorize the director of the Department of Development to enter into agreement with the Community Shelter Board for the purpose of implementing the crisis response system to authorize expenditure of $1,537,704 from the general fund and to declare an emergency. And Ms. Loken, can you please share um, how, how these dollars will be used? Sure. The proposed legislation in this area for the crisis response system supports the largest single adult and family shelters in Columbus. And as you know, shelter is not a home. So thankfully, this legislation also funds rapid rehousing services that are so important to help people get out of shelter and get into housing. Um, in this area, we're continuing focused work for veterans to make sure that um, any veteran who experiences homelessness has immediate access to help and is never placed on a waiting list and gets help to get back into housing immediately. We are also continuing focused work for expectant mothers to both prevent and end their homelessness and help make sure their babies are safe and healthy. We will um, do that thanks to this legislation tonight as well as legislation that Council approved back in February. I would just add that none of this work would be possible without your support. Thank you for your leadership and your partnership, and from where I stand, what is a very deep and far-reaching commitment to vulnerable people in this community. Thank you. Councilmember Stenziano. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Sarah. Just wanted to thank you and the Shuttle Board's uh, leadership, your board and your staff for the ongoing work and engagement, not only through the funds, but what you do every day in different neighborhoods. I know just last week we were on an email chain uh, with work in Franklinson, and I know the ongoing effort and commitment uh, the Shelter Board has for businesses, uh, for residents across the entire city. So really appreciate the partnership uh, and thank you for your on personal engagement and again, your staff's ongoing engagement uh, as issues come up, but to make sure we're finding uh, safe, affordable housing for residents across the city. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, President Pro Tem Stenziano. Sarah, I just have a question. What, are the, what needs are you still seeing in terms of our homeless population? 
We are definitely struggling with the opiate epi epidemic and figuring out how to be responsive to the changing needs of our population. So our partnership with uh, Mary Haven becomes ever more important as they grow their services in that space. Um, that partnership is more important than ever. I would say um, there's a lot of work still to be done with veterans for us to move forward on our benchmark and goals to meet federal criteria. We're trying to be really innovative in how we get at um, the needs among veterans. And most recently, we um, explored a very cool partnership with a private sector partner at Worthington Industries where they designated their Six Sigma Black Belt team um, to kind of take apart our system and the client flow to see how, how a veteran is um, interacted with from, from day one until they make it into housing. And I just thought that was a really unique partnership through a, a private sector lens, how they could apply their lean practices to the nonprofit sector and a human services space. And um, the lead person on that team was a veteran, so found the work very meaningful. So that continues to be something we're very focused on. My last question is, what is the number one reason that you see families um, having to utilize a homeless shelter? A lack of affordable housing and a gap uh, between what they can earn uh, despite a willingness to work and then being able to afford a housing. So a gap between um, earnings and what it costs to take care of their family. And uh, I just think that is such a pressing issue for our community and we are making um, great leaps in that space. I'm so proud and excited about some of the progress that we're making in that space, but it continues to be true that uh, despite a family's willingness to go to work every single day, that does not protect them from extreme poverty and homelessness. And that's a real challenge. Well, certainly, thank you um, for sharing that information this evening. I know that um, this council is certainly focused on any of these areas. Council member um, Page has been focusing on eviction because I know individuals who have been evicted come to the shelter. I know that this body is certainly um, focused on um, and will continue to focus on the area of, of poverty, working with our partners in our community. Um, also, I know that um, Council member E. Brown has been focused on making sure that um, individuals are, are earning a livable wage and, and trying to you know, make sure that happens. I mean, there are significant challenges that we still face in our community. I mean, we have, and we have some great prosperity here too, but there are certainly some, some challenges. And so I know as this body, we want to continue to work with the shelter board, with also our, you know, our private nonprofit sectors to be able to hopefully help individuals from not having to be able to utilize the shelter. But again, um, until those issues are solved, we're thankful to be able to have a shelter for individuals uh, and families to be able um, to participate in. And I know that even some of the average weight yearly salaries of people are $4,000, $6,000. I mean, it, it's unbelievable. So we're all working together as a body and I'm with the administration and the community to try, how to, to try to resolve some of these issues. But again, I thank you um, for the leadership of the shelter board. Thank you, board, um, and uh, thank you. Department of Development, Mr. Stans, who's there working. So thank you um, for coming and sharing. Thank you so much. Thank you. And um, with that, I will um, move for passage of this legislation. Thank you. Brown, 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 Page, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Is passed. Thank you. I just have two announcements sure. from um, Health and Human Services. The first is on this Friday, there will be a candlelight ceremony at 7:30 at Lifeline of Ohio. And I know that last week I think we had the resolution um, for Lifeline, but they wanted me to make sure that they want to honor. Um, provide hope for people who are still looking for organs, um, organ eye or tissue donors, donations, but also they want to receive them, but also make people continue to educate people on the need. And then lastly, on April the 16th, which will be next Monday, Bravo is ha hosting an event, Survivors of Violence. It's a peer support group, and their first meeting will be April the 16th. Um, April 16th from 7 to 8. And if you are in, want to go to that particular support group, you can dial 614-294-7867. Again, it's Bravo Buc Buckeye Regional Anti-Violence Organization. Thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman Tyson. Any other business coming for council? 
Seeing none, I ask for motion to adjourn. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Harden. Meeting number 20 adjourned. We will take uh, speak, knowledge into speakers momentarily. Regular meeting number 21 will now come to order. Uh, clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Harden. Can I get a motion to dispense with the reading of the journal? Is there a second? Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Harden. We will now go to the zoning committee. Councilmember Tyson chairs this committee. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Harden. Before beginning the, beginning the zoning agenda, I'll briefly explain the rules of council as pertaining to speaking before council on zonings and variances. We permit three speakers on each side, three proponents, three opponents, and we ask that they limit their remarks to three minutes on each side. And we provide an opportunity for rebuttal from the applicant. On the advice of the city attorney's office we ask that anyone here this evening who wishes to speak either for or against a council variance including staff please stand raise your right hand and be sworn in i wish to tell the truth anyone stand I'm like, I'm just watching everybody sit down. I know people want to speak. So I'm like, oh, I wish to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. Please answer, I will. Thank you very much. All right, so the first ordinance is 0743-2018. To rezone 2090 Frank Road, being 11.3 acres located on the north side of Frank Road, 735 feet east of Harrisburg Pike, from our rural district to CPD Commercial Plan Development District. The applicant is Franklin County Board of Commissioners. The proposed use is the Forensic Science Forensic Science Center and Morgue. The city department's recommendation is approval. Southwest Area Commission's recommendation was three to three, which is uh, considered a disapproval. Are there, I mean, we need a staff presentation on this legislation. Is there any speakers on this legislation? No, seeing none, then I would move to amend to emergency. Second. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Harden. Thank you. I move for passage. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Harden. Thank you. The uh, second and final ordinance in this committee today is ordinance number 0581-2018. It is to grant a variance from the provisions of sections 3355.03 C4 permitted uses, 3372.604 setback requirements, 3372.605 building de design standards, 3372.607 landscaping and screening, 3372.608 lighting, and 3372.609 parking and circulation of the Columbus City Codes with a property located at 2172 Cleveland Avenue to permit automobile sales, leasing, and rental with reduced development standards in the C3 commercial district. The applicant is Tahani Ala Syed. The proposed use is automobile sales and leasing and rental. The city department's recommendation is disapproval. The South London Air Commission's recommendation is approval from nine, nine to one. And I don't know, we need a staff presentation on this. President Hardin, Pro Tem, Stenziano, Chair Tyson, and members of council. The site is subject to a zoning violation for establishing an automobile sales use without obtaining zoning clearance. The site is zoned in the C3 commercial district and lies within the Cleveland Avenue urban commercial overlay. The requested council variance will permit the use which is not permitted in the C3 district and will also grant variances to existing site conditions that do not comply with the setback, building design, landscaping, screening, and parking requirements of the UCO. A variance is necessary because automotive uses are only permitted in the C4 commercial district. The site is located within the planning area of the South London Neighborhood Plan Amendment, which recommends mixed neighborhood use for this location. That designation envisions a mix of uses built to UCO design standards serving the neighborhood and reinforcing a walkable environment. The preponderance of automobile-oriented uses is inconsistent with the broader mix envisioned by the plan. Consequently, 
Staff does not support additional automobile oriented uses along this corridor. Any decision to support a proposal allowing such uses on this site should be should include commitments to UCO standards, including graphics, screening, and landscaping. For these reasons, city staff recommends disapproval, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, and before I make any other, I'll ask you some questions in a few minutes. Um, is there a presentation or statement from the applicant? Is the applicant here? Yes. Good evening, please Good state evening. your name and who you represent. Uh, Omar Tarazi on behalf of the applicant. Uh, so what we have here is a parcel that uh, is, uh, he purchased it uh, as it was operating as a used car lot. He's actually a refugee from Iraq, didn't know what he was doing and he bought a, a property as a um, used car lot and because it was functioning in that way and then we find that it's not in compliance. On the positive side, he operates it very well. He's got all of the, uh, part of the application included letters from all of the neighbors in support of his application, um, including, uh, of course, as you know, the area commission also voted in support. Um, basically, the variance would be to allow him to continue to operate it uh, in his current condition. Uh, with, uh, as part of the site plan, though, he does, has, uh, would be improving the property, uh, improving the in input and output of relating to it and uh, adding, um, uh, you know, asphalt driveway in and out, which currently it's gravel. Uh, gravel. So I give the balance to if there's any questions as to uh, to the application. We do have a speaker, and then we can come back. Okay. Come Thank back. you. All right. Thanks. We have our one speaker who is against this, and that is Lucy Wolf. Please come to the podium and share your comments. And again, you have three minutes. Good evening, Chair Tyson, Good members evening. of council. I'm here on behalf of my client um, who owns a property at 1543 Cordell Avenue. Um, and he's he sent me this, he's out of state, so he wanted me to read this, so his concerns are, are voiced. Um, first, the use of the parcel as a car lot is not in keeping with the stated ideals of urban design as listed in the South Linden uh, neighborhood area plan. Uh, secondly, there is already a car lot across the street because of a, this, a second car lot in the immediate vicinity will not further encourage a higher level commercial mix use along Cleveland Avenue. <clears throat> the parcel on which the car lot is being used has already been demonstrated to be too small for this use. The applicant had used the residential parcel behind the alley for the purpose of storing cars and put up fencing not in conformance with regulations. Um, a complaint was made because of this, but now the lot is degraded. He's asked, saying that once this was a relatively nice mode lot and now it's not. And for this reason, he's opposed to granting this variance request. That would be very, that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Wolf. Any questions for Ms. Wolf? Councilman Page. Thank you, Councilmember Tyson. I do just have one quick question. Your client, is that a resident, a residential structure? He is uh, an investor who has invested in Columbus, not only in this street, but in other areas. And um, because there's a tenant there, the tenant did not let him know that was happening next door on the residential lot. And when he brought this up to me, I looked at the aerial shot and said, wait a minute, I'm going over there to see what's happening and discovered all the, the cars that were parked on the residential lot which means maybe this parcel along Cleveland Avenue is too small to handle all of the cars that, that he might incur for his business, so. Okay. Ms. Wolf, could you tell me the, again, the address of your client? The, my client's address is 1543 Cordell. Okay. And it would be the first parcel next to the vacant lot where they were parking cars and erected a, a fence. Um, it's right there. Okay. He feels that this devalues his property. 
having that happen. Okay. All right. I'm going to have okay. the applicant come back up. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. You have three minutes three minutes to respond to her um, her her concerns. Okay. As far as that lot, um, I, my understanding of the facts are is that the, that fence was actually erected by the previous owner. Um, that's my knowledge of the subject. But my client has removed the fence uh, since it was an issue, and he has cleared the lot. And so now, since the fence is gone and the lot is, you know. I mean, anybody can see whether or not somebody's parking cars there. Obviously, if he does it, he doesn't intend to use it in the future unless he comes back and either gets a different variance or sells the lot or does something else with the lot. Um, but at this point, it doesn't have a fence. And so, and he knows obviously that he won't do it. But if he, if he does do it, anybody will just see the cars there and complain and, and he would have a, another complaint against him. So uh, we don't, he does not feel like he needs that lot for the purposes of continuing his business. And as far as the business of the subject lot, um, if uh, other, other than a used car lot, it really is not set up for any other real purpose. It has a very, very small uh, structure in it that I can barely stand up in uh, without hitting the ceiling. Uh, and uh, that's you know, all about it's useful for is a little office to sell cars uh, in a, on a small little lot. So uh, we believe that he has taken affirmative steps to address the concerns of the neighbor and uh, that moving forward, those concerns will, will not be there. Thank you. So before I know that we even put this legislation on for tonight, that we made sure that uh, that fence was down, the property was cleaned up, because we were not going to move forward based upon some of those concerns. And again, this was a car lot prior to your, your client um, purchasing this property. So it isn't like it's some new use on this land. It was already a car lot that's there. And we've made sure that that, again, the area that was of some concern was rectified before we brought this to the count, to this body. I don't know, any questions still? Councilman Brown. Yes, sir. You made mention of improvements, but you only, only talked about one, and that was the, the paving of the access in and out, I guess. Is there any more? Um, well, the, in, to, in relation to the property from here forward, yes, the improvement would be the, the, uh, uh, the, the driveway and how the driveway works, and then um, striping, because there's going to be some striping and parking space, and the whole lot has to be organized. Uh, you know, better moving forward. Um, as it relates to the back property, he has cleaned it up. He's removed all of the, there was, a, there was not, it wasn't fully used as for cars. He had like three or four. He's removed all of those and cleaned that lot up. So, uh, and he's maintaining it as in a clean, presentable uh, fashion, uh, manner. Thank you. And I just want to remind my colleagues that this was a nine to one vote from the area commission. Councilman Remy. Yeah, I would like to know um, what type of, was there any type of requirement for a landscaping plan or um, along those lines? I mean, we were significantly concentrating on this area uh, moving forward and waiting for a report to come out from the um, Ohio State in regards to this corridor in particular. And so um, I've heard some trivial changes, but I want to hear if, if there's any other plans and if zoning had, had required that. We have, if you're asking me, or zoning, I'm sorry. All right, well, then. Um, land, uh, UCO standards are being varied for this development. Uh, that includes landscaping and screening, uh, lighting, and uh, some other things. But that would pertain only to this current development. If this site were ever to be redeveloped, it would have to be uh, redeveloped to the UCO standards, or they would have to reseek variances. In other words, they're not being required to follow the UCO plan? Not currently in this proposal. Okay. Councilmember Elizabeth Brown. Um, I just have a couple questions I think are quite short. Hi, Mr. Sharathi, how are you? Um, uh, so first, if we were to deny this, he effectively would have to shut down his business? Yes. Um, and. Second, uh, the 
the point that the neighboring parcel made about the cars being parked there and you said that he won't do it anymore. Um, do you have a sense of why he was doing it in the first place and what accommodations he has made to ensure that he won't do it anymore other than just complaints like do it till I get away with it, right? That's not a, a great no, contingency I, plan. I don't think that, first of all, I think that what happened was is he bought it and it, that's how it was running is that, okay. you know, this was the car lot, and then if you have a few extra, you throw them in the back lot, and he bought it all together, is my understanding of how things went. Um, and, but he, uh, he, not only is it, in, like, in addressing the point, because the fence is not there anymore, you can't store. St Before, it was a wooden, like, you couldn't see unless right. you physically walked up and tried to peek through the slats. So, so now that's gone. Um, and if, with that being gone, you can't store anything back there without it being incredibly obvious to anybody going by who would immediately a complaint you'd have you know the city there so I think that that aspect of that that issue is resolved okay. um, but to the other point that was said the, yeah there's all kinds of cars car there's like a car mechanic on the parcel immediately next door for example there's all kinds of car repair car sales all up and down there mm -hmm. and you know this today is basically do we shut him down or not uh, he is open to doing further improvements but we really haven't heard any uh, improvement suggestions or, or anything other than, you know, okay, put in this driveway uh, uh, in and out and that that would improve things in terms of getting rid of all that gravel. Yeah. Um, as far as the fence, there's currently a chain link fence that's up and around uh, the, 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 the property. It's not a very big property, actually. It's actually kind of small. Mm -hmm. And um, so there's not a lot you do with it unless you completely redesign it for something else. Okay. Thank you for the clarification and thank you, Council Member. Council so Member Remy. Just one quick question. Why does staff not offer recommendations like that? You know, I'm curious as to why staff wouldn't make recommendations on landscaping and that sort of thing if an applicant's willing to do so. Uh, planning staff is the ones that sort of go through this portion of the site compliance. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I mean, they're varying them for a reason. Um, if they're willing to add them, they could be removed, but I don't think he could meet um, UCO standards currently, no matter what. If I can just want to say, as on behalf of the applicant, I, we did approach them and said, is there anything that we could do to improve that would, you know, be positive and constructive from your end, and basically they said, no, just it is what it is, apply for the variance, and here you go. Thank you. Chairman Mike wasn't on. So yes, the vote was, I just had it in front of me again. The vote was nine to one for South London's recommendation for approval. Okay. I mean, I, I'm, I'm recommending that we support this legislation. I do understand that where the, the staff of the city's view is based upon that, um, I, I do understand what their thoughts and concerns are. However, I also know that it is a business and if you know where this area is, there are like some auto mechanics, car dealerships there. And so, um, and again, I think that we leave it to the area commissions to also state what they want in, in their community. And they have voted nine to one to support this business. So I'm recommending, um, and I'm in support of this legislation. And so with that, I would, move for passage. By taking from the table first, I move to take it from the table. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Thank you, and I move for passage. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Thank you. And if there are any, if we, you know, obviously if there are any concerns with that, people will be calling 311 or, or um, calling our offices. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank That's you. all I have in zoning this evening. Thank you, Chairwoman Tyson. Uh, any other business coming from the zoning committee? Seeing none, I get a motion to adjourn.
Uh, clerk, call the roll. Brown, Brown, Page, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Adjourn. Thank you.